I don't collect stamps. I don't collect shoes. I don't have a cellar of fine wines. From a young age, I've been collecting conversations. And the really good ones, I like to bottle and keep. I browse, I seek out people, and I talk to them. Weird, creepy, a stalker perhaps? I'll let you be the judge. You see someone walking down the street carrying an unusually shaped object. What do you do? A, ignore them. B, say, hi, what's that? C, stare. You've guessed it, I'm in the high what's that category. Just imagine the impact of asking every question that pops into your head. Oh, I like those shoes, where did you get them? What about that hat? What's your dog's name, if they have a dog? I've made a career out of collecting conversations, and this began in August 2011. I was on St John's Road in Battersea, when I saw a group of teenagers wearing hoodies, carrying a dustpan and brush. I said, what are you doing? They explained that there'd been riots in Clapham Junction the night before, and they were going to be clearing up the glass that was outside the Dixon's electrical store. I was intrigued by the conversation, and I said, would you mind if I recorded this? They looked at me and said, why would you do that? I said, because it's important to see what teenagers are doing. They then looked really worried. A year later, I'd set up an audio platform for the voices of the under 25s. I called it podium.me, the idea that you put yourself onto the podium and talk about anything you want to talk about. You don't have to dress up and put on a broadcast voice. You don't have to even go into a studio. You can use your phone and you can talk on the street or in your room. Recent topics have included binge drinking, running, adoption, personality disorders, and portrait painting. I was asked by a senior BBC producer, how do you get young people to talk? My reply, I just ask them a question. Sometimes I like to step down into my little conversation cellar and look at the row upon row of connections that I've made over the years. Some were fleeting, some intense, some emotional, some completely unmemorable. I was on a bus heading north into the centre of town, the three, four, five, and I met a woman with a young baby. We got chatting, I had young children myself, I remembered what it was like. I thought nothing of what I'd said until a few years later. My sister, who looks very like me, was on the same bus heading north. And a woman came up to her and said, you changed my life. My sister looked confused and then the story came out. That lady had been at a crossroads in her life and apparently whatever I'd said had helped her to make a decision. Our cities are known for being really unfriendly places. But what would happen if we forgot the taboo that said you can't connect with people? Conversations on social media are simple. Face to face, take practice. When I was a teenager, I was on a train heading from Newbury to Reading. I got chatting with one person, and because this wasn't a city journey, other people in the carriage got involved. Soon we were having a lively debate. And then one woman said, this is reminding me of something. A few months ago, I was in the supermarket queue, and a woman got chatting to me and invited me home for lunch. We all looked rather shocked. I asked her to describe where she'd gone. She said, well, we went up a farm track, and there was a cottage at the end with a plum tree outside it. I said, let me stop you there. That was my mother. <laughs> I tell you that story to show that this is not genetic, it's contagious. The more we model it, the more it will grow. Conversation skills can be taught. I received an email from someone who'd just done their GCSEs who wanted to do a work experience placement at podium.me. I interviewed him. He could make good eye contact and had a decent set of exam results, and I agreed to take him on for a week. Day one, we were heading for a European conference. I explained that we would have to do some networking and talk to people that we didn't know. He looked absolutely terrified. I said, don't worry, just copy me. So we walked in, and we saw a man slightly older than the other delegates, helping himself to a coffee. We sauntered over and introduced ourselves, and sure enough, he was one of the speakers, a good person to connect with. A couple of conversations later, and I left my student to fend for himself. The next time I looked round, he joined a focus group discussing the future of the Lithuanian education system. <laughs> Job done. I'm not mean, well I hope I'm not. I like to get people out of their comfort zone. Conversations really can change situations. They can also be therapeutic. I was on another train, I do a lot of train travel, <laughs> heading west out of London and it was deserted. Not much fun for somebody like me. And then an elderly lady got on. 
She sat down and started to read a tiny, ancient, leather-bound, gilt-edged book. It was beautiful. And I couldn't help myself from complimenting her on the book. She looked up and her eyes sparkled. And I suddenly realised that I might be the first person who'd spoken to her that day, or possibly that week. She told me proudly that she'd inherited the book from her Spanish mother and that she was thinking about the memories as she read it. We spent the next 10 minutes talking about life, death, memories and books, and then we parted company. That conversation has stayed with me because I realised that it broke down barriers of age, of nationality. I love to talk to people who are not like me. Conversation can change your business. I was heading home from a meeting with a brand consultant and in my bag I had three logo boards. We were trying to choose logos for Podium.me and I looked around the carriage and it struck me. I was sitting in the most perfect focus group different ages, nationalities and backgrounds in a captive space. And before I could think about the consequences of what I was doing, I called a meeting. Excuse me, everybody, can I just have two minutes of your time? I've got three logos and I need to decide which one to go with. Nobody seemed to think this was odd at all. I dread to think what they told their friends over dinner that evening. Anyway, after a couple of minutes, we'd unanimously chosen the logo, which is the logo you see today. And I realised that what I had done was something bigger than choosing my logo. I'd brought people together. I realised that you could change your nation, just start a conversation. I've been doing this a long time now. And I've learnt things. I wasn't always this confident. This is fake. I've learnt it. I've studied it. I've practised it. And I'm going to give you a mini masterclass now. You're getting onto a plane and your seat ticket says 3B. So you find your seat, and in 3A is a young man wearing headphones. Lesson number one, never start a conversation with somebody wearing headphones. They're giving out clear signals that they're not wanting to talk. But after you've read your book for a while, the food and drink trolley comes round, and the young man takes his headphones off, this happened last Friday, and says, Please may I have a ham and cheese toasty, a ham and cheese croissant, a chocolate brownie, a sparkling water and a coffee. Now that's a conversation starter. <laughs> I couldn't help myself. Wow, I said. <laughs> he spent the next two hours telling me about his spiritual journey, about the fact that he was going on a cleansing week and this was his last chance to stock up. <laughs> Who would have known? My final story involves a young person, some shoes, and a cunning plan. A friend of mine has an 18-year-old son, and he was consistently going out of the house wearing odd shoes. She was concerned. <laughs> Is everything OK? Are your A-levels going all right? Are you stressed? How can I help? He turned to her with a cheeky grin and said, Mum, I wear odd shoes because girls start conversations with me. I end with a challenge. Who are you going to talk to today? Thank you.